Well, hey everybody, welcome to this On One Live event. Uh, really exciting stuff today. We've got a big announcement. We're going to do some live editing. Uh, it's it's going to be a really fun bunch of content. Mm -hmm. We're really glad you joined us. I'm Hudson Henry. I'm proud to be hosting this here in my studio. I'm a Portland, Oregon based adventure commercial photographer, and I have the great pleasure to, to coach in the On One Plus. Mm -hmm photography community, and I'm joined here by Dan Harlicker. Hey Hudson, thanks for uh, joining us in the studio, letting us borrow your office. I'm Dan Harlicker, I'm the director of product at On One, and thanks for coming today. So we've got some fun stuff to share with you guys today, a lot of new things that the uh, guys with Dan have been cooking up at On One. And you know, I, I wonder, how do you guys even pick what you're gonna work on next with the software? You know, it's, it's kind of an art and a science all at the same time. So we're very customer driven. That's kind of a, a, a catchphrase, but for us it's true. It's everything we build is based on what our customers tell us they want. It's not just a bunch of engineers saying, oh, here's a cool piece of technology. How could this help a photographer? It's kind of the other way around. It's customers come to us with their problems and then we figure out what's the most elegant way to solve those. The best way that we get a lot of that information is through the On One Photo Project, which is a special section of our website where users can actually submit feature requests or change ideas in there. Then other users will read those, they'll comment on them, they'll vote on them, and we use that feedback that comes through that mechanism. We've had over a thousand feature requests that have come in through that. And that's really what is kind of the beginning of how we decide what to work on. Then from that, we take the highest ranked, the most commented features, and then we go out to another group of photographers and we kind of survey them. We say, you know, how important is this stuff? And we can really measure importance of features related to other features. We kind of pick out the ones that we think are the most important based on all that feedback. And then I'll sit down and I'll design it out looking for the most elegant way to solve that problem. And then we'll share it with the community through the On One blog and to our partners and gurus like Hudson. And we'll get their feedback on it. And they'll say, well, you know, that's good, but I wish it did this one more thing that it needs to really make it great. And then we go off and that's how we decide what to build. That's kind of the next step. And a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today, actually everything we're going to talk about today comes from that photo raw project and the feedback from customers like you guys. I think it's such a fun kind of crowdsourced collaborative process. You know, it's the same way that we run the photo, or the, the On One Plus community basically, is people chime in with what they want to learn about photography and we sort of drive the content in that community in the same direction. And I think overall it's just, it's just kind of emblematic of the culture at On One. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think uh, a lot of people know the software really well, but they don't stop to think about the people behind the software. You know, and the, the way that I came to On One was through personal relationships with a lot of really great people. You know, On One is not a big monolithic corporate company. It's, it's just a, a bunch of people, a small group of people really here in Portland, Oregon. And they're really some of the nicest people I've ever run into and had the joy to work with. Uh, you know, I remember my first introduction to On One just happened by chance, really. Mm -hmm. I was up uh, photographing on top of Larch Mountain, which is one of my favorite locations near here, Portland here, that's got this great overlook of Mount Hood. And I was up there this evening where the moon was rising a little bit east of the mountain, and there was this just kind of lovely cloud carpet spread across the base of the mountain. And there was this, this other photographer up there working with the same camera as I, the, the Nikon D810 had just come out and we were both out there working with our cameras, uh, struck up a conversation, you know, and it was one of those kind of easy conversations where both of you are good enough at your craft that you're able to kind of keep working with your camera and have a conversation at the same time. One thing led to another and this, this kind of friendship bloomed and, you know, we wound up over the intervening years really getting close like brothers and, and at the time I had no idea, but it wound up that, Rick LePage was the vice president at On One and invited me in to take a look at the software and meet the people that he worked with. I made friends from Craig Kudel, the CEO, down. And over the intervening years, I've just become more and more a part of the company, not just because I love the software, but because I love the people who produce it. Um, and, you know, the list goes on and on of all the, the fun relationships that I have <laughs> with you guys around yeah. the office. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, it's my family. I've been there for 12 years now. And, you know, we started the company as photographers wanting to build great software for other photographers. You know, we're not a big company with shareholders with lots of other products where we have to do what is best for the board of directors. You know, we do what's best for us, what's best for photographers. Right. You know, it's a very close, tight knit group. And, you know, as a matter of fact, I want to give a little shout out to Tim Brown, one of our lead developers. He uh, became a grandpa today and with baby Henry. Congratulations, mm -hmm. man. So we have a little video that we prepared for you guys to, to give you an even closer look at the people behind the software that you love to use.
Photography takes you places. It makes you see things in a new way. It makes you remember what really matters. What really matters. What really matters. And it lets you engage with the world in ways that can change you. Photography is changing. But it will always have that potential. To take you somewhere new. To take you somewhere to new. To take you somewhere new. And it's been our goal to help you get there since the beginning. Back then, we just had a couple engineers in a tiny office. This cramped little office. But a belief that we could run a software company more like a family. The model was simple. We were photographers and we knew what photographers wanted. Along with some dedication and a good team, we figured that was enough. And it worked. And it worked. It worked. And it worked. We grew. We grew. But we never got so big that we forgot why we started this in the first place. So our approach is still simple. We just listen to what our customers want. This approach led us to completely retool our code from the ground up. With the release of On One Photo Raw. And it meets dozens of customer requests to make it into each new version of our app. We hope you find that simplicity as refreshing as we do. We have also expanded to education and training. All right, let's go ahead and get started. A natural fit for a company started by photographers and still run by photographers. Photography will keep changing and we will too. What won't change is our passion for it, our dedication to our customers, and our promise that wherever photography takes you, we'll be here to help you take it even further. So now that you got a little better idea of the people behind on one, We've got, we've got a big announcement today, right, Dan? We do have some uh, big announcement today. So everybody who's joined us today, you've probably looked a little bit at the Exposed project where we've been kind of showing you some of the technologies that we're working on, but we didn't really tell you what that was for. Well, today I'm happy to announce that all of the stuff you've seen in the Exposed project over the last month is part of On One Photo Raw 2018, the next generation of On One Photo Raw. It'll be coming out at the end of October, but you'll actually be able to get the public beta and use it on Friday of this week. So in just a couple days, you'll be able to get it in your own hands and start to use it. There's a ton of cool new features, and we're going to walk through all of those, and then we're going to dive deep into some of them as well. So we'll do a little live editing. And, and for those of you in the Plus Pro program and the Plus Pro community, uh, you already have Photo Raw 2018. It's if you're just checking your products, you'll see that it's there, ready for you to start test driving right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you that want to check this all out later, maybe you don't have time to watch us do some live editing and demo the product. We're going to be recording this whole thing. You can easily watch it later. For those of you that have questions, we're going to do a, a long Q and A mm -hmm. at the end of this live presentation. And you know, if you want to submit questions, you can just type them into the Facebook live stream, or there's a chat window on the viewer that you're watching on, on the website. So go ahead, put those questions in, and we'll do our best to get to all of them at the end of the uh, live show today. So, yeah. Dan, you want to talk a little bit about some of the yeah. stuff that's new? There's tons of new stuff. So let's actually dig in, and I'll give you a quick tour of what's new. So we're going to start off here in the user interface. You'll notice that it has been updated and is more modern. All of those hard key lines are now gone. The fonts are easier to read. The accent color, we've switched over to orange, but you can pick the accent color that you want by going to your preferences. There's now an option to pick a range of accent colors. And if you don't want any color in your UI, you can always pick the silver option. I do that when I'm working on black and white photos. And just to remind people, you can always change your background color as well. This is the color that appears behind the photo when you're editing it or when you're in detail or compare view. You can use the light gray option if you want something that's more like a middle gray right. for comparing. But you can always pick any color you want for that too. Now, beyond the, the pretty new face, there's a ton of new features. And for me, my favorite one is the new HDR module. With HDR, you can take a range or bracket of photos shot at different exposures and combine them together. You can get the deepest, darkest shadows and the most subtle highlights by doing HDR. So I'm going to grab this bracket here. Let me walk you through it. There's an overexposed bracket to get the detail in the pier, one that's underexposed to get all of the light 
in the sky and a middle exposure. I'm just going to grab these three. These are all Sony RAW files from an A7R2, I think, or an A7R. So these are big files. Mm -hmm. I'm going to select those. And right over here, I'm going to click on the HDR button. All right, everybody count. One, two, three, four. There we go. Four hard. seconds, and you've got a nice full screen preview of it. That is lightning fast compared to the competitors. Most other apps take close to a minute to get to this same spot. All right, so when it comes up, you note down here in the bottom, there's a little tray that shows me all the frames that were in my exposure. Now, you could do it with as few as two photos, but you could also do it up with like 15 or 16 photos if you want to as well. It will tell you the relative exposure value across the brackets, and whichever one is selected is kind of the key frame. That's the one that will be actually used for the exposure and for the deghosting. So I'm actually going to switch down. I'm going to grab the one darker exposure to make sure I get all of those information up here in the sky so we get all that sunset. Then over on the right, we include the tone and color and the HDR look pane. Mm -hmm. All the essentials you need to make that HDR look great. Now keep in mind, this is all non-destructive. All the settings that you set in tone and color and HDR, you can re-edit later inside of Develop and FX. So you're just essentially making a, a, a raw file with all that tonality combined to the three images. Exactly. When I hit the save button, I'm actually going to get a big high bit linear file. It's a new file format called an on photo. Think of it like our version of a DNG. Okay. So it stores all the information from those three squished together into one linear file. Linear basically means it doesn't have any corrections applied to it. It's the raw data of all three of those together. And then it flows just like any other raw photo through the rest of the workflow process. Let me give you a couple other things of note down here. At the bottom, you have control over how much deghosting is applied. You can turn on an overlay to see the areas that are going to have deghosting applied to them. You can also decide where the file goes when I'm done with it. I can go back to browse or I can send it straight to developer effects to do more editing. I'm going to make a couple adjustments here on this photo. I probably want to bring my shadows and my brightness up a little bit so I get all the detail in those piers. So I'm going to grab the shadow slider and I'm just going to turn this up a bit. And I'm going to grab my black slider and I'm going to bring it down. And if I hold the J key while I do this and I move the black slider, I can actually see that black point. Oh, so yeah. I want just a touch of black in there. There we go. I might bring my highlights down just a little as well. So if you do these tone and color adjustments, then later, once you've got the file created and you go back to develop, all these adjustments are still yes. exactly where you left them. None of this is, is baked and cooked. This nice. is all just live settings, just like any other raw photo. So the reason we put this here is it kind of gives you the quick start sure. into something. So you can do the basics. And now after this, I will probably go in and I'll start to use effects and add a vignette and right. do sharpening and all that kind of stuff afterwards. But sure. it's just kind of the core stuff that you want to do. You notice the HDR look is also in there as well. Right. And I like to use the HDR look. I use it at a pretty low setting, kind of the natural setting on most photos. But you could turn that off if you don't want to use it at all. Mm -hmm. Or you could turn it up really high if you want that turned up to 11, that sort of a look. Or down even more subtle. Yeah, or down even more subtle if you want. So Nice. There we go. Something more like that. And again, I'm ready to hit save. Saves out that new on photo. Now that on photo, of course, you can export to any format you need. You can make it a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG for sharing or use in other applications. Right. Very cool. Yeah, so that's HDR. Now, kind of very similar to HDR is the new Pano feature. With Panos, you can stitch multiple photos together to create a panorama or matrix of photos. So I've got an example here. Let's take a look. I've got three photos shot here in the valley in Yosemite mm -hmm. from the tunnel, kind of that classic tunnel view. Right. I want to take these three, and we're going to stitch them together. Same process. You make the selection in Browse, and you click on the Pano button. And it will pop up a preview here for us pretty quick. There we are. Very quick. Yeah. Down at the bottom, I can control what happens to the edges of that photo. I could leave the crop to none, at which point you'll see kind of those dark edges where the camera lens distortion pops in. Sure. Or you can crop it off, basically, or you can use the warp to fill option. I'm going to use the crop option in mm -hmm. this case. Again, I can choose where it goes. I'm going to send this one back to browse. And then next to it, there's a cool little option here called pan Add Panoramic Metadata. When this is enabled, it adds some extra metadata to it so that apps like Facebook or other apps that understand panoramas will actually present that photo in a spinnable space. So like if you do realty photography right. or interior shooting, you can actually uh, kind of spin. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. It's like VR. Nice. Yeah. And of course, if you don't check that, it'll be presented as a normal, normal flat panorama. Mm -hmm. So you choose when that appears. All right, so those are kind of the two biggest new changes, but there's a bunch more. There's also versions that we've added as well. Let me show you how versions work. So I've got this original photo that I've gone into effects and I've done some work to it. Let's take this into effects here. 
There we go. Now, let's say I like the work I've done, but I really want to try a black and white mm -hmm. treatment for this. So I'm just going to bring up my film strip here at the bottom, and I'll just make a copy of this version. This is actually already a version to start. <laughs> that way I can go back to my original. I can always make another version. I'm just going to go to my settings menu and say create a version, or I can right click and create a version, and it makes another version, another copy of that photo. And now I can apply something different to it. Let's but that's not creating a new file on your hard drive. Exactly, it doesn't create another file. Now, from browser's perspective, it kind of works just like another file though. You can have its own settings, its own metadata, you can put it in albums, you can publish and share it just like another photo. But on disk, it's still just referencing back to this one original photo, which of course is untouched, it's all non-destructive. Right. So let's say I want to take this version that I created and I want to make it black and white. I'll just open up my preset drawer. Let's see, it looks like I was already in the black and white category. Let's find one that we like for it. I'm going to go with Dramatic Sky right here. And watch, I'm just going to control click on that and say insert preset. That'll stack the black and white on top of the work I've already done. So now I'll get a black and white version of it just like that. Very cool. Yeah, so you can make as many versions of the photo as you need to. So you could even select 100 photos, they make a version, you get a one version of each of those 100 photos, and then nice. you could select those and apply the same preset to all of them. So it's a great way to work. And it saves a whole lot of hard drive space. It saves a whole lot of hard drive space, makes it really easy to kind of go back. You can think of it like a snapshot too. Sure. I mean, you can basically make a version every time you get to a point where you want to be able to go back to it as well. All right, let me jump back to browse here, and we'll keep talking about some of the other great new features that we have. All right, so beyond the, those, we've also added some cool new masking technologies. And we're gonna dig deep into that in the second half of the broadcast. We'll talk about all of the cool things that you can do in terms of masking. We've brought the blur and chisel tool back so that you can easily mask edges. We've also added new tools where you can change the density and feather on a mask and some great powerful tools for luminosity masking for advanced users where you can really narrow down a very specific tonal range based on that individual photo. I'm gonna show you how to do that. It's probably one of the most powerful new features it's that's really in there. Cool. It's yeah. really cool. Another cool feature we've added is the uh, ability to, when you take pictures on your iPhone, to have them automatically go back to your desktop for you. They'll upload them in the background. And that uses the On One Photo for mobile app. Some of you might have remembered Photovia. This is kind of the next generation of Photovia. So over here on the left in my albums, you see I've published a bunch of different albums. These are kind of my portfolio, my favorite shots, divided up into these categories. Of course, it helps when I've got my hard drive plugged in. <laughs> and then on my mobile device, let me show you here. Takes a it's, a, uh, it's, it's really cool the idea of being able to just have whatever you photograph on your phone pop up to edit on your, on your editing platform. Yeah. I think that's just such a nice thing. So here we are on my phone. I'm just gonna swipe over. You can see there's those same albums mm -hmm. that I published from my phone. I can browse and navigate those. I can click to view one closer. I can drag it in. I could change its rating down here at the bottom. I could even share it to social media. I could share it straight to Instagram if I wanted to. And then any photos that I've taken will also get uploaded as well. So right here in the mobile upload section, when I click on that, I'll actually be able to see photos that I've uploaded for my device as well. As a matter of fact, there's one from Hudson from about a half hour ago when we were getting started with the show. So it's a very powerful tool for taking your photos with you, doing remote editing and calling. You know, I'll take a, come back from a new shoot, I'll push it up to my iPad, mm -hmm. and then I can sit on the couch and I can go through and do my tagging and rating and not have to sit at my computer to do it. So, nice. And then of course, it's great to have all the pictures you shoot on your phone find their way back to your desktop very automatically. That's something that seems to get harder and harder every year mm -hmm. is getting the photos off of your phone back, so. Mm -hmm. That's really nice, you know, and, and in the past I've done a lot with, with say, Dropbox, just kind of auto-uploading, but then you have to sync in your Dropbox folder and get it in, yeah, it's really nice to just have that ability. Yeah. Not to mention having all your albums on your phone whenever you want. Yep. There's a couple other cool things. We've made some great improvements to adjustment brushes and the adjustment filter pane. That's one of the most commonly used tools. Let me show you what we've done. I'm just going to grab a photo and I'm going to go into develop here. And let me just close up the preset drawer so we have a little bit more room to work. Mm -hmm. And we'll go to local adjustments. Now local adjustments work like any other filter, but you're going to paint them in or reveal them with a mask. Some of the cool things we've added is right down here, there's a new option called paint with color. It allows you to paint with a solid color or to change the color of something in your photo. I'm gonna use it to do a little bit of skin smoothing on this portrait. So watch, I'm just going to turn on the paint with color option. I'll grab the eyedropper and I'll sample a color out of her skin. Mm -hmm. 
Then I'm going to make sure that my brush has a nice big feather on it and a pretty low opacity, around 10 or 15%. Now I'm just going to paint this in over her skin. And this is going to paint with that color, but at a very low soft opacity. It's a mm-hmm. great way to smooth. This is the equivalent of like digital powder. It is. Look at just that. Like that. Now this is a pretty old fashioned technique, but it is tried and true and I use it all the time. You can even change lighting contours using this same technique. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a soft effect. Yeah. It's very natural. Yeah. Well, and the beauty is because it's on that adjustment layer, I can mm-hmm. always change it. I can come in and I can change the opacity right. of that layer. I can also change the color that I use as well. So let's say I've done that, but I want to turn up the saturation just a little bit. So I can bring up that color picker. Maybe I'll bring the saturation up just a little bit. And you can see it can very subtly increase or change the color of her skin without it looking unnatural. And that, I love the nuanced ability to, with this kind of masking and opacity control, work right on the raw file. Mm-hmm. It's fantastic. Yeah. Now I'm going to use another adjustment, and this time I'll show you one of the other new ones that we've added. So I'm just going to hit on add layer. And this time I'm going to use the new noise slider. The noise slider lets you remove noise or enhance noise. I'm going to use it to reduce noise, which will also help smooth out her skin as well. It helps soften up the texture and the pores of her skin. This is something I've done a ton in landscape photography and you know I always wind up creating a PSD and using layers and this is nice. Just yeah. to be able to do it right on the raw file. So watch, I can just paint this oh, yeah. right on there and that will smooth out the texture in the skin. For the big stuff, I'd probably go back with the retouching brush and clean up those if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. It just kind of depends on how strong or versus how subtle I want this look to be. And the cool thing is I can always go back and change it by adjusting that opacity. Mm-hmm. So, all right, one more. Let's go in. I'm going to show you how you can use that paint with solid color to change the color of her eyes now. I'll just hit the add layer button. I'm going to select paint with color. This time, rather than using solid paint, I'm going to use the replace color option. Let's grab the dropper. Let's say I want to use the green out of her shirt. There we go. Let me make my feather a little smaller, my brush a little bit smaller. Oops. Leave the opacity where it was. I want my brush just a little smaller. And I'm just going to dab it right there on her eyes. Boink. you got to be kidding me. Boink. Just That's like that. crazy. Yeah. So we went from, there's our original, to our change. Wow. Just like that. Bam. Cool. So those are some of the cool new things that we've added to those adjustment filters. Now, those adjustment filters also carry all the really cool new advanced masking tools. And again, I'm going to go into great detail about how to use those a little bit later on. Yeah, and we're gonna, I'm going to jump in and edit a, a panorama from, from basically start to finish and, and do an HDR with, with a couple of my images. Dan's going to talk about masking, but before we do that, we're going to take a, a quick break. And I got a little video to share with you guys. I, I had this really amazing workshop at Silver Falls State Park. It's kind of the crown jewel of Oregon State Park system. It has all mm-hmm. these beautiful waterfalls. It's set out in the middle of farm country. I had an amazing group of students, and we were working, doing a lot of HDR, doing a lot of panorama work. Uh, I was flying a drone. I've actually been quiet about that, but I've been kind of playing with drones this last year and getting getting a little bit better. And so I decided to kind of film them working and mix in some of their images and just put a little video together from that workshop. So here you guys go. Hope you enjoy it.
Well, hopefully that gives you a little idea. We had such a good time in that workshop, and it was it was just perfect conditions. It had rained the whole oh, week I before. That's like one of my favorite places. It doesn't matter what the weather is, what the time of year is, you're always going to get great shots there. Yeah, we had just a hint of fall color kind of coming mm -hmm. in. We're definitely going to run that workshop again next year. I have a whole bunch of workshops coming up in the next year, and, and I still have a couple slots left in my uh, Moab workshop. If anybody's interested, jump on my website, HudsonHenry.com. Uh, so at this point, I'm excited to show you guys uh, some yeah. of the cool new features in, in Photo Raw 2018. And, and for anybody that knows me, uh, panoramas are a huge component of my photography. I've been doing them for years and years and years. I actually started doing panoramas back in the days of film, taking multiple medium format film images and weaving them together in the <laughs> older versions of Photoshop before there was any automation. And it's exciting to, uh, to have a button to click and suddenly, you know, just a few seconds. It's a lot seconds. easier now it's, than it used to be. <laughs> it's a lot easier than it used to be. Yeah. And it's just as much fun. So I'm going to jump here on, on my old uh, Mac. I don't have the fancy new machine that Dan has, but, uh, but it'll work just fine to show you some of this stuff. Uh, and I'm actually going to jump in here. I've got this day. Uh, this last winter, we had snowpocalypse here in Portland. It's, it's unusual. <laughs> we had a huge amount of snow. Uh, and, and my family went out, we went cross country skiing. I, I had my little guy Pike in a, in a backpack and my wife and my aunt. Uh, and we all went and kind of toured around the winter wonderland that was downtown Portland. And as I was, uh, I was looking at the scene, I took just a cell phone photo of, of the downtown, kind of did a pano and thought to myself, wow, it's really still and reflecting. We've got all this crazy snow. I should go out tomorrow morning. Uh, and so I went back the next morning and got a beautiful dawn with the snow and a, a really colorful sunrise. Right. You have to explain why yeah. there's the pictures of your fingers in I, there. So. I do have to explain. Hudson what doesn't these... take pictures of his fingers normally. <laughs> well, I do. I do. Yeah. Whenever I'm whenever I'm creating a series of images to blend into one thing, whether it's a time lapse, whether it's an HDR series, whether it's a panorama. I always want to identify that for myself. So I'll either put the lens cap in front of the lens before I take the first image in the series or I'll put my hand in front of the lens. And then, you know, let's say something happens and it's a couple of weeks or who knows how long before I get around to finally being able to go and, and cull and sort these images. I see by this, by these fingers in the, in the frame, oh yeah, this is a panorama. This is a series of images. I remember doing that. And I'm not likely to go, oh, I don't like this image. It's boring and delete it. Yeah. Um, and then I'll color code them. So for me, you know, I'll select all the images in this range and I've already done that. I'll make sure that I tag them all as blue. Um, so I've got a second series here that I want to work with the more fun panorama. And yeah. you can see that this early morning I put the lens cap on so it's not weird looking fingers mm -hmm. in the frame, but I've got a couple dark slides here. One of the cool things I was gonna, I didn't mention earlier is there's another new feature which lets you easily take a group of photos like that, a bracket, mm -hmm. and group it into a subfolder instantly. So you can make that selection, right click say make a subfolder, and you can either copy those photos into it or add or uh, move those photos into it. And it will use whichever photo you want to represent that folder. So it works just just like a group does, but it keeps it in a normal folder structure so that when you go on disk, it's still organized like we all like. That way we're not trusting too much to a database or to a software. So it's sort of similar to the way that Lightroom does stacking, essentially. Yeah. Think cool. of it like stacking, but it's backed by a real folder. Nice. So right. that when you look at it in another app, it's still there. I see that right there yeah. in my menu. So yeah. for this purpose, you know, the, the first thing I'm going to do with a series of panorama images after I've identified them, after I put them into a subfolder, after I tag them all blue. Uh, I'm going to grab one that's emblematic of darker parts of the image and brighter parts of the image. And, and I'm going to go ahead and just jump into the uh, develop panel or the develop app and, and have a look at uh, just the basic settings here. Make sure that I get that raw file adjusted the way that I want. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead and, uh, and, and do a little of the white point and black point first off. So, oops, I'll just uh, go ahead and, and hit the J key so that I can actually see what's happening with my whites. And in this, this image, you know, there's just not that, that much blown out except these little lights in the town. But when I do my blacks, you'll see that it's pretty easy to get to the black point here. I've got a little bit of room in the highlights. So I'm going to kind of make sure I've got as much contrast as I want. I'll probably boost the shadows a little bit in this image. Um, potentially pull the highlights back a little bit to get some more drama in the sky, just a touch. And, you know, I can play with the contrast, whether I want more, whether I want less. Oops, I got to get a hold of that slider. And I probably want maybe a little bit less in this scene. 
Another thing I'll likely do, um, I'm pretty sure I shot this at the base ISO with my camera, yeah, ISO 64. So I basically have no noise to worry about in this image. But I might do a little sharpening, and I like to hold down the Option key while I'm sharpening so I get a, a black and white view. It's nice and clean to just sort of pick an amount. And it's a relatively sharp image, but you know, somewhere in here it gets it just a little bit sharper yet. And I'd rather do that on the RAW file before I create a new panorama of the whole thing. So I'll back back out. And you notice I'm not getting rid of those birds and all those little <laughs> local adjustments at this point. I'm going to wait till I have a merged image to do yeah. that kind of localized work. I'm just doing global tone and color edits here. Yeah. I'm going to uh, go ahead, back into Browse, I'm, and then the next thing I do is just click on the Pano button. Oh, nope. I want to sync all these files. So I've got all of them selected here with the one that I just did a little bit of editing on represented. It's highlighted, clicked on. And I'm going to go ahead and click Sync here. And that's going to synchronize all those little develop settings that I just did through the entire range of images in the panorama. And the next thing I do is I just click that pano button that Dan demoed uh, before the last break. And boom, there it is. Quick and easy. Um, it, amazes me how fast it renders that panoramic preview. You know, it's, it's just really shocking. And again, the, the options that we have, we could just have the rough edges mm -hmm. as it was photographed and merged together. We can crop so that there's no rough edges. It's just kind of cutting down to the pixels that it can cut down to. Or we can have it warp to fill the frame and not lose any pixel data. You know, in a, in a photo like this with buildings and straight lines, I'm much more likely to choose crop uh, just to keep all the lines straight and everything looking the way that I want. So I'm going to choose crop, can add that panoramic, panoramic metadata so that if we load this into, you know, Facebook or something that's VR ready, it'll let mm -hmm. us scroll around and look around at the image. And I, I want to reopen this thing in effects because I'm going to want to do just a little bit of work on it. So if I was to click save right now, I don't have the speedy fast computer that Dan has. And any time that we're rendering panoramas and merging and blending, yep. you know, you hit save and it's time to go get a cup of coffee, you know, any software that you're using. So, but particularly an older machine like this. So I'm going to kind of use the Julia Childs method here. I'm going to back out and I'm going to open up one of these that I did yesterday using the software so that you guys don't have to sit and, and watch the save line. That's the cooked turkey version. That's the cooked turkey version. Yeah. So I'm going to jump into effects with this image, and, and it's a larger image, so it'll it'll take a, little, a second here as it's as it's kind of rendering out here. Yeah, like we'll look at the at the file size when we open this thing up. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's a pretty big file, and this was you shot this on your D10 Nikon D10. Okay. So yeah. each one of those images is 36 megapixels. So here we have it. You know, as I look at this, I see first thing I probably want to do is do a little cropping because we've got a little of the edge of the shore in here, and I'm going to pull. I'm going to pull up so that that rule of thirds line is right across the water line there and get a nice uh, nice look to the edge there. I'm going to come back so that I'm cropping that snow out. You know, I could easily go and clone that out if it mattered to me, but I don't really need that, that extra bit off to the side of the big OHSU buildings and the antenna on the hill. I'll probably crop in on this side just past this bridge sign uh, and just hit the return key and we've got a nicely cropped image the way that we want. To me, the shadows are a little dark, so I'm gonna jump in and add a tone enhancing filter. Uh, and I'm just really gonna go ahead, grab the shadows and pull them up. And what I might do is zoom in here and have a look at that seawall that looks kind of dark to me. And I just wanna make sure that there's good, good detail in the shadows here without, without you know, messing up the sky in any way. It's all looking really good to me. Looks a little bit oversaturated in the sky. I remember it was that way that morning, but you know, sometimes sometimes I back the saturation off a little bit before I'll share an image. So I'm probably going to go in here in the uh, well, yeah, I'm going to go in here in the color enhancer since I started talking about it. There's one other thing I want to do that Dan knows what it is, <laughs> um, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use the. Um, the little what do you what do you call this brush it's tool the again? The targeted color tool. Targeted color tool, and I'm going to adjust the saturation with whatever I click here. Grab that tool, and I'm going to click on these pinks because they just seem a little oversaturated to me. And I'm just going to drag to the left. You got a little bit of a rainbow wheel here because it's such a big. Uh, well, let me click it one more time here. Drag to the left. There we go. And I'm just reducing that saturation to get it looking just a touch more natural. And then I want to go ahead and I want to adjust the luminance, the brightness 
of the blues. So I'm going to switch that, that targeted color tool over to adjust brightness, click it one more time. I'm going to grab a hold of the blues and just drag them back to where I'm darkening that sky just a little bit, creating just a touch more contrast in the sky. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Then the final thing I want to do is add a bit of dynamic contrast, which I do to all of my landscape images. And, and personally, the natural look is, is a, little, it's a little intense for me generally, so I've created a little uh, style here. And I think anytime you're using an effect over and over in the software, it makes sense to just go ahead, create your own style. It's as simple as you've got the sliders in the place that you find you often want them. You come down here, save new style, name it. I've got one here called Hudson's Dynamic Contrast. And it just tweaks these sliders a little bit and backs the opacity down to a look that I tend to like. And if I, I click here to take a look in at what this is looking like by the moon, you get an idea of, of the resolution that we're dealing with in a panorama. You know, this is what I absolutely love about working with panoramas is, is just how much detail you can get. You, yeah. you can print. Uh, we actually just did a print uh, of, of this image 15 feet wide in a building here downtown. I had a little show and it's it's up on the wall 15 feet wide. Dan came to the opening and it, it really is kind yeah. of amazing. Oh yeah, it's great. You can go up and you can look at the, the tiniest little details in the in the windows and things like that. Because this is how many pixels wide do we decide? It's pretty big. It was like 15,000? 16,000 pixels wide. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty big. Pretty big. Hey, I wanted to remind everybody out there that the beta will be available on Friday. So I know there's a lot of folks who are excited about it and they're going to their account and looking for it. It won't be available till Friday for the beta. And that's for everybody, not just Plus members. Plus members and anybody can download the beta, but not till Friday. So cool. All right. Well, so you'll get your own hands on it mm -hmm. really, really soon here. Day after Blade Runner. Day after Blade Runner. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then I'm going to jump in next and work on an HDR series here. So th this is from a trip that my wife Stacy and I took to Europe right before we had our, our first baby Pike. Uh, in fact, we found out that we were pregnant on this particular trip. We went over for a wedding in Greece for a, a dear friend. And this one evening, we're out near Notre Dame, perfectly clear blue sky day, you know, not the most dynamic day to photograph. We're always looking for clouds. Mm -hmm. But you know that at that last moment, as the sun's going down, you have the potential to get a sun star and some drama uh, in a scene. And I found a place to the east of Notre Dame along the Seine where, you know, I use Sun Surveyor in my app and I just figured out right where to be to be a little ways away where I could use a long lens, zoom in on Notre Dame and try to capture a sun star as it was setting behind it. And, you know, there was so much contrast in the scene, I knew I wanted to bracket it. So I've got those three bracketed images right here, and it's, I'm not even going to do any adjustments to them before the fact. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to blend to get that tonal range of all three RAW files. And again, these are big 36 megapixel D810 files. And I'm going to go ahead and hit that HDR button here in Browse. And it's going to look, what, what's it doing right now is it's loading these so up? So it actually has to, has to obviously get the data off the disk and then mm -hmm. merge those together into an HDR. Wow, fast. So here I've got the preview and I'm looking at my develop tone and color, the basic tone and color settings from develop as Dan showed you guys earlier. And again, you know, we can go over here and uh, hold down the J key and just grab a hold of the white point slider and see where we're blowing out the color. You can see the sun is kind of blowing out the whites right now. So I kind of want to adjust it. Yeah, it's pretty good as it is. The black points, I'm sure, are very close to, to the edge without making any movement. So there's not a lot of contrast I want to add to this image. I actually probably want to pull the contrast back. The biggest thing I want to do is add shadow detail. So I'm going to get a hold of that shadow slider, pull it up, and you can just see that detail from the brighter image yeah. coming through. You know, I'm getting to have all of that nice, rich detail in the shadows that there's no way I could have captured in a single image in this kind of contrasted scene. And then you go ahead, maybe pull the contrast back a little bit just to get a little less contrast. And, yeah. you know, that's looking pretty good to me. I don't think yeah. I want to make I like a whole how you've lot. kept that really natural, too. You haven't gone crazy with the shadows or anything. No. It's, it's very tempting in an HDR app to, to go to that crazy level. And, and keep in mind, you, you can, and there's cases where you want to do that, especially with Urbex, you really want to crank oh, things yeah. up. But on something like this, you know, if we were to brighten that foreground a ton, it wouldn't look realistic, even though, you know, you can yeah. do that. It I just could crank up. It starts to take on that look that we 
most of us don't favor anymore. Right. I mean, I could yeah. I could start doing that if I want to, but that's not really my style again, you know. So I'm going to back the uh, the HDR look back down to a, a more normal level. I really get that that tone, that natural look that I want, and that's one of the things that excites me about this. You know, before before this was available, and, and Lightroom's another one that lets you kind of get a natural look to your HDRs. I used to just bracket images throw them together in layers and just paint shadows in really meticulously and it's time consuming. Very time consuming and really hard in those mid-tones to get yeah. a blend that looks realistic too. This is a huge, huge time saver. Yeah. So once I go ahead and click save, it doesn't take nearly as long as a panorama even working with these big <laughs> 36 megapixel files on, a, on an older computer platform, but it's still doing some things. What? Yep, still has to, to process that full linear data and it has to create a, a a version with the settings apply and so that right. it previews quickly and store all that additional metadata mm -hmm. that goes along with it. In order to open that file up again, we have to know what kind of camera it was and a lot of different the parameters on the camera in order to interpret that linear data correctly. That's why it's saved in that on photo, our new proprietary format for containing that. Again, you can export that to any format at the end of the day. So. Very cool. And I've told it that I want it to open in effects, so it, it bounces back into browse for just a second and now it's automatically loaded us into effects. And we still have the settings from the HDR look that are left over from, mm -hmm. that, from that HDR merger panel. And I can go ahead and add, one thing I want to do right off the bat, I'm going to add a local adjustment. And this is one of the things I like in Photo Raw is how local adjustments are available whether I'm in develop or whether I'm in effects, they're always right there in a tab to the right. I'm going to go ahead and grab my graduated brush and just drop this graduated filter in here. I'm going to increase the feather a little bit. And I just want to, I want to increase that, uh, that, that kind of color gradient that was happening in the mm -hmm. sunset sky. So at the top of the image here, I'm just feathering in a little bit blue or white balance. And I'm getting this nice yellow, gold to blue look to the image. And you can see I've also turned the exposure down a little bit to just kind of darken that sky up at the top. And then I'm going to jump back into my overall settings. And, you know, no surprise to anyone here, first thing I'm going to do is add a little dynamic contrast. I'm going to go ahead once again. I'm going to grab that, uh, that style that I've created to just tone it down a touch. I might even turn the opacity down just a little bit more. I don't want it to be too crunchy. And the thing that stands out to me right now is that some of the concrete in this scene is a little bluer than I might like. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add a color enhancing filter. And what I'm going to do is just pull the saturation back globally on the entire image. I'm going to go ahead and grab that slider, pull the saturation down. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm grabbing the wrong one. Grab the actual global saturation slider. I'm going to pull it back image wide until that concrete in the church and in the seawall is looking a little bit more natural to me. And then I'm going to use the power of masking on the raw file here. I'm going to invert the mask so that we're just painted solid black over the whole mask so it's not showing through at all. The power of masking. The I power like of that. masking. <laughs> and I'm going to grab a hold of my masking brush and switch it to paint in. That'll put a little plus in my crosshair of my brush. Um, I'm, you know, I don't need a 100% feather, but I, I want a pretty strong feather, maybe a 50% feather. 100% opacity, and I'm going to use the perfect brush. The perfect brush is going to keep it so that whatever I, I hover over with that plus crosshair in the center of my brush, if I don't move my brush outside the lines, it's not going to paint outside the lines. So I'm not reducing the color of the sky as long as I don't cross out of the church into the sky. And I'm just essentially painting that blue out of Notre Dame here and then out of the seawall. You can see it happening, boom, right there. We're getting a little bit warmer look. I have to be a little careful because the water and the seawall are pretty close to the same shade. So I want to stay close in there. But you can see the mask that's created. Really nice job there. Um, it's subtle but it definitely takes the blue out where mm -hmm. I don't want it. And then the last thing I want to do is a vignette, and I love the way that Photo Raw does its vignetting. The big softy is my favorite, <laughs> uh, but I like to turn the feather 
all the way down to zero so that I can really see where I'm putting this mask. And then I can mess around with its roundness. I want to make it a little bit more of sort of a traditional ovalized vignette. Uh, I, can, I can mess around with the size a bit. And then one of my favorite things is I can grab the little centering tool and just grab a hold of that mask and move it wherever I want in the frame to just be focused over the part of the scene that I want to stand out. And then all I need to do is pull that feather back to 100%, I like it nice and soft. And then just adjust the brightness to taste. And that, that's looking good to me. Now, the one thing I'm gonna say is the yellows look a little oversaturated to me at this point. So I'm probably gonna bounce back to develop. One of the things I love is the way that you can just bounce mm -hmm. from finish editing to your raw processing adjustments. You know, we're still at the raw file here. And I'm just gonna pull the saturation overall back just a little bit, just to get it a hint more natural looking. You know, I think that the longer I'm doing photography, mm -hmm. the more I find myself reducing saturation oh, yes. instead of boosting yeah. saturation. And a lot of times the last step for me is, let's see how saturated do I really want yeah. this thing. That's one of the things I love about having that opacity control on every filter and even in effects mm -hmm. at the top of the overall stack that yep. you can fade it back. I do that all the time when I'm doing portrait retouching because it's so easy to overdo it so easy. on portrait retouching. And then you can go back and you can decide how strong do I want that? And it's all non-destructive so you can go back and, and do it next year because every one of my landscapes, I go back and look at your it's like, oh, what oh, was I thinking? Way overdid that. Yeah. Or even the Talk next morning, you know, yeah. you'll be editing late. You suddenly look down, oh, it's two o'clock in the morning. You stumble into bed, mm -hmm. baby wakes you up in the morning. You get back to the studio, you look at it, you go, oh, wow, wow. I really overdid yeah. that. Yeah. It's, it's very just, tempting to do it. It you is, know? it is. It's like, what is it they say? With great power comes great, great responsibility. Great responsibility. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, this is going to be a really dramatic before after. So uh, you guys prepare yourselves. Here you go. Here's, here's what we've taken this thing to, and here's what it started out like. Yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, and quick. Yep. I mean, compared to the old process I had of making multiple exposures, putting them down in layers, and then just hand painting the shadows back in without touching the highlights, this is, it's like a dream come true. Yeah. It's really, really cool. So Dan, you're gonna talk a little bit about the new cool masking yeah. tools that we have available? Yeah, we're gonna jump in, we're gonna talk about some of the improvements to masking. But kind of before we get into that, I just wanted to explain what masking is for folks who don't. Most people who are watching today are kind of familiar with a mask. A mask is just a technology that lets you modulate how a filter or another layer or image blends in with what's underneath it. Mm -hmm. So all the adjustment layers and all the filters can all be applied with a mask. And white mask, an all white mask is kind of a reset mask. It's gonna let everything appear on top of what basically whatever it's associated with. So if you have a filter like a black and white and you've got a white mask on it, everything underneath is going to be black and white, right? You can then use any of the masking tools like the masking brush or the bug to create a mask that's adding black or shades of gray to that white layer, which is then going to hide portions of that, like the black and white. I'll just I'll do it really fast just so this makes sense for folks. And just if, if anybody has any questions at all about the software, about what we're talking about, you know, go ahead, ask those questions on the Facebook live stream or on the chat window of the viewer on the web page. We're we're gonna be taking QA right after this. So. Yeah. So here we go. I just added a black and white filter. You can see the little thumbnail. That's actually showing the mask. If I hit the O key on my keyboard or hit the little view button right here, it'll actually show me that mask. That mask is totally white. Everything from the black and white is being applied. Then if I grab something like the masking brush and I just make a stroke through here like this, you notice how we see the black on the white. Anything that is black in the mask is going to hide whatever it's associated with. So if I go back to, I turn the view off here. You can see how now I'm seeing the color through there. That's kind of masking in a nutshell. And the opacity, basically how black you're painting with, if I paint with 50% black instead of all black, let me undo that stroke here. I'll bring my opacity down and I make that stroke. And I'm gonna make it a hard stroke here by turning my feather down. Mm -hmm. So if I only paint at a lower opacity and we look at it, now you can see there's a little bit of black and white and a little bit of color. It's gonna blend those two together. Right. That's kind of how it works. Now. We've added some cool new options in here. One is a density option, which will change the overall opacity of that mask. So let me turn that mask view on so you can see it. I'll grab this density slider and I'll turn it down. So it lets you control how strong the mask is overall. It's a great way to change things. So sometimes uh, you wanna do the opposite. You've painted and you wanna increase it rather than decrease it. This lets you do that. Rather than increase, decreasing the layer opacity, you can decrease the mask opacity to bring more of it in. 
And we've also added a global feather option. The feather option is going to soften and blur that mask globally. So that's another great. really handy tool. All right, so that's kind of the basics. Let's dig in and I'm gonna show you how to use this in practice. And then I'm gonna show you some really cool new luminosity tools that we've created as well. Let me reset this and we'll go back and grab a different photo that we're gonna work on here. I love that feathering slider. Yeah, that one's a really handy one. And if you like to feather um, uh, locally, you can do that now mm -hmm. with a new blur and chisel tool. I'll show you how to use that in just a second here. Let's grab a different photo. I'm just going to go to develop first. And I just want to tune this photo up just a little bit before we get started. I'm going to grab my black slider. This is the same kind of work you see Hudson and I do on just about every photo. And this is the sort of thing you're going to do on just about every photo as well. You want to set a white point and a black point. That's what sets the contrast range of the photo. That's what's going to make it look great. Now, in this case, I want this photo to be a little on the dark side because I'm trying to make something that well, I've shot in midday and I want to make it look more like it was shot in the afternoon. Right. And I'm going to warm this up a little bit here too. There we go. Now, let's take it to effects. And I want to put a different sky in there. We had this boring blue sky. I want to put in more of a sunset looking sky. So I'm just going to use the texturizer to do that. We'll add a texture. I'm going to use a sky. So I'll go to the sky category. Let's scroll down until we find one that we like. Uh, Got so fun. We're seeing yeah, like let's go with 100 this looks one on here. this image. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to change my blending mode to replace mm -hmm. so that it's really going to paint that whole thing in. Now, keep in mind the mask right now. It's all white, right? Mm -hmm. So we're seeing that whole sky. Well, that's not going to work. I really want to do the opposite. I want to flip it around. Right. I want to selectively put that anywhere I want. So that's what we use the invert button for. Yep. So we'll hit that invert button. It's now hidden. The mask is completely black, right? Right. Now I want to paint white into the sky to reveal the new sky. To do that, we'll use the masking brush, and I'm going to turn on that perfect brush option. Mm -hmm. The perfect brush samples the color under the middle of the brush, mm -hmm. and then we'll only paint away or paint back in that particular color. So I'm just going to start to paint here and look how it's going to bring that new one in. But as I come down and I hit the rocks, see how it stops mm -hmm. at the edge of the rock for me automatically, just like that. All right, I'm just going to run this along here. Let me turn my feather up a little bit. I got it turned way down. Oops, I should probably have my opacity up at 100 too. <laughs> there we go. I always feel like there should be some sort of background music for this. No, right. Andy, next time we got to find some some basking music. <laughs> a little flight of the bumblebee or something. <laughs> the the perfect brush is such an amazing yeah, tool. I just I, I remember the it. first time I used it, I was like, "What?" Yeah. Now, when you get to something tricky like the tree, watch what I'll do. I'll just come right to the middle, make my brush a little smaller. I'm going to hold down the command key on the Mac or the control key on Windows. I'm going to click and that locks the one color. So rather than continuously sampling the color, it's just going to use that one color that I was there when I clicked. Now it'll let me brush right inside of the tree and get rid of all the blue on the interior of the tree. So you don't have to worry about keeping that crosshair out of the parts you don't want to yeah. paint as long as you're holding yeah. that. It's, it's control for PC and Yep, control command. for PC, command for the Mac. And of course, if you make a mistake, you can always go back and undo, and you can paint things back in. That's part of the beauty of this system, though, too. So, Control, command, Z is your friend. <laughs> All right, so there we go. I've kind of done a very quick mask, but if we zoom in and we look at the edges over, oops, it's a little spot I missed right there. Let's grab that. Hey. Zoop. Yep. All right, if we come over here oh, a yeah. little bit more. And we look along the edge, you can see how there's a little bit of a blue halo along there. Let me grab a different, Pretty different minor, one so it's easier to see here. Yeah. Here's the cool part. I can swap that to a different sky easily. Eh, let's see. Let's find a sky that shows that off a oh, little bit yeah. better here. It's not there for a second. Eh, here. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty dark one. Mm -hmm. Let's grab one that's a little more believable for this. Here we go. All right. So you see how there's that little bit of a blue edge along there. To clean that up, I'll use the chisel tool. The chisel tool will push the edge of the mask in or out a little bit, depending on your mode, whether you're having it set to add or subtract. I'm going to turn it up really high, just for illustration's sake here. And I'm going to set it to remove. And if I brushed along here, see how it's moving the edge of the mask out? Mm -hmm. I don't want to go that way. I want to go the opposite way. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to set it to add instead. And if I brushed along there, it pushes the edge of the mask in. That's obviously more than I need. Let's turn it down to a more modest amount, probably more like five or six here. You notice I'm using the little built-in scrubby sliders? Mm -hmm. This is just one of those habits mm -hmm. that people may have not noticed. If you click on the label 
yeah. amount or size or mode and drag left or right it lets you change the size you can use your bracket keys or using a wacom tablet of course the pressure can change those options as well here so there we go i'll just run that little chisel tool right along that edge to clean that up i love the scrubby sliders yeah i think that's definitely the way to go it's probably my favorite method for sure probably some more along here especially if the edge is looking a little too hard it's a great way to smooth out that edge now kind of the sister of the chisel tool is the blur tool so if i grab the blur tool right above it the blur tool will soften the mask so like that feather slider where it blurred the mask globally this lets you blur it selectively just where you want so it's great to use along an edge if I wanted to soften an edge. So if I paint along here, you can see how it's taking that hard kind of artificial edge and it's just gonna blur it just a little bit. Right. Now, some of the cool improvements to this is the amount slider has a much larger range than it has in the past. So at a very small amount, it's a sub-pixel blur. It's like an anti-aliasing sort of blur. Cool. But I could also turn it up really high and I could actually use it for localized feathering. I could mm -hmm. use it and have it create like a 200, 300 pixel blur mm -hmm. if I wanted to as well. So that was actually feedback from one of our gurus, Scott Davenport. So. Nice. All right. Scott's full of good ideas. Yeah. No, he really is. So that's kind of the core of how we would do that. Now, let's go back to a fit view here. It's probably not the sky I really want to use. It doesn't look quite realistic, but it makes it easier to see those edges. Let's grab one that looks good. That's one of the cool things I like is once you've done that masking, you can flip through those and kind of find the one that you like. If you happen to like to do sky replacements like I do, I highly recommend the Big Sky Replacement Pack from Brian Matiche. Mm -hmm. That's available right now. It's a uh, photo kit. You can get it, I think, through tomorrow. Yeah, There's a great deal on day. that. Yeah. yeah, so definitely go get that. He has tons of additional skies that you can use and lots of great videos on how to do it as well. Maybe we can keep a little promo for that after this. Yeah, at the end, maybe we'll kind of show you what that looks like here. All right, so there's kind of the uh, basics of some of the new masking improvements. Let's jump in and talk about the new luminosity masks, though. That's where things get really powerful. I'm going to grab a different photo here. Let me reset the settings. And I'm going to open it up into develop. All right. This is one of those shots where it's like, oh, it's got such great bones, but it's mm -hmm. not quite there yet. So let's tune this up a little bit. I'm going to grab my shadow slider. I'm going to bring that up a bit again black slider let's make sure we got some real contrast in there mm -hmm. just a little bit you know that's probably about all i need maybe a little extra saturation there we go all beautiful right. image it's a beautiful shot but mm -hmm. we're gonna go we're gonna take this one to 11. so the thing that i love about this shot is you've got this uh, i assume it's an island or this ridge in the foreground with all the green and it really kind of pops away from the water in the mountain i want to accentuate that i really want to make it pop so we're going to use the luminosity mask to do that I'm going to add more detail and sharpness here and reduce it back in the foreground and the background so that the middle ground pops more. Cool. So watch. We're going to go to effects. I'm going to start off with our favorite filter, <laughs> dynamic, <laughs> dynamic contrast. contrast. Yeah. So we'll add some dynamic contrast in here. Not to be a broken record. <laughs> it really is a pretty awesome tool. Yeah. So I'll add dynamic contrast. Now right now it's applying to the whole darn photo. So mm -hmm. it doesn't really help us meet our mission. And I could use any of the other masking tools. I could use a brush and I could go through and I could paint it off. But you know, if you look at these trees up here, they're very, oops, they're, it's uh, very subtle. And it's, uh, it's gonna be really difficult to paint those because the background yeah. colors are pretty close to it as right. well. But they are a little different in terms of brightness, right? Yeah. yeah. So watch, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna roll down that advanced masking button mm -hmm. and there's a little luminosity button right here. It's a new I'm, button. Yep, I'm gonna click that guy and that's going to add a luminosity mask. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with a luminosity mask, it's a black and white version of the photo. It lets you use the actual luminosity, the actual uh, brightness and contrast in the photo itself as a way to mask it and to apply settings locally. It's a very powerful technique. Now, what I want to do is I want to apply that dynamic contrast to just these dark areas. Well, we know masks work the other way. We have to flip it around. We yeah. want it to do the opposite. So I'm gonna hit the invert button to start. There we go. So now everything that's white is gonna get it. We're getting closer. Right. Still the sky is gonna get some and the mountains are gonna get even more. So down here, there's a new levels and window slider, hmm. which are designed just for manipulating these luminosity masks. I'm going to adjust this so that I get white really just in these darkest, darkest areas. So. 
watch how we do this. I'm just going to grab the levels slider, the black handle of it. I'm going to pull it in. You notice how the sky goes totally black. That means it's not going to get any of that dynamic contrast. And I'm going to keep moving that black clip in. There go the mountains. Yep, there go the mountains. I'm going to get it down until I really get to just the area that I want. Really, just that foreground area. That's like that. wicked cool. Yeah, so I can target just that area that I want. If I turn that view off now, mm -hmm. now you'll see how that dynamic contrast is applied, really, just to those trees. It's creating a three-dimensionality in the image already. Yeah. There we go. And then I could go in and I could use my brush tool set to paint in. Oops. Mm. Oh. Paint in. You can always hit the X key. That's the, the trick for fixing that. Yep. I could come in here and I could paint in those little other spots that I want to add some. So like in here and along the steps. Yep. Probably on the church steeple a little bit too. Keep in mind I'm doing this kind of quickly for demonstration purposes. You'd want to zoom in and take a little oh, more yeah. care the in the brush final might artwork. Help you there too, oh yeah. Bit, yeah, yeah, and the perfect brush would be handy for this too. But just to kind of get us in the ballpark. Yeah. All right, so that's made it pop a little bit, but still, it's really competing with the contrast in the mountains. Especially, I mean, you look up here, you get this high contrast. That's where your eyes being mm -hmm. led to. So we want to soften that out a little bit. So we're going to use that same trick, but we're going to use it to apply a blur. So I'll hit the Add Filter button. Let's go to Lens Blur. There we go. It's added a nice blur to the whole photo. I want to do the opposite. I want to protect that middle island area. Right. So we'll go back to our mask. We'll hit the Luminosity button again. Let's look at the view of it. Mm -hmm. Now I want to kind of do the opposite I did before. I want everything in the middle ground to go black and everything right. outside of it to go white. So right. rather than moving the levels to the right, we're going to move the levels to the left. The left. Yeah. So I'm just going to grab that white point slider. And I'm just going to pull that in and keep scooching these over until I get those mountains pretty much gone. And I'll bring the black point in to really yeah. choke up those mountains. So there we go. So now it's going to apply a lot of lens blur to the sky and a bit of lens blur to the mountains mm -hmm. and no lens blur to the foreground. And let's turn that mask off and see. So maybe that steeple. Yeah. yeah, steeple's there. Again, we'll just paint that back in. Yep. Boom. <laughs> yeah, same thing with that little pesky rock over there. Masking is so fun. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if you're a black and white shooter, I do a lot of black and white photography. As a matter of fact, there's a black and white master course that I'm doing for Plus that'll come out uh, next month. Mm -hmm. We'll use some of these same techniques for that because you can really kind of do the zone system. You can use, I didn't show these to you guys down here, but there's the window slider. Mm -hmm. The window slider lets you uh, define a mask on a very narrow tonal range of the image. I'll show you, I'll give you an example here in just a second. All right, so there's kind of our before and after. Let's take a look. Before, that's the original out of the camera. And then after, isn't that crazy? Uh, uh, it's yeah, amazing it's what you can do using wonderful. those luminosity masks. You know, I might just paint that foreground water out just mm -hmm. a little bit too. So let's bring my feather all the way up and oops, switch it around here. There we go. And I'll just paint right across that foreground of the water. Right. So it gives us a little bit more blur in the front. So you get this very shallow depth of feel, almost like a miniature sort of yeah. a feel yeah. after the fact. But without the miniature, yeah, it's yeah. really nice. Yeah. So that's pretty sweet. Let me show you really quick how that window tool works. Let me jump back and I'll grab a different photo. Mm. <laughs> ah, here we go. We'll use this one. That looks a bit like Silver Falls That's right there. Silver Falls. Yeah, <laughs> one of my favorite spots. All right. I'm going to add a uh, black and white filter to this. Starts with a B. <laughs> and let's add another filter. I'm just going to add a tone enhancer in this case. And let's say I want to really take the mid-tones and I want to darken just the mid-tones a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I can bring my exposure down a little bit. I'll open up that window and now I'll open up the advanced masking section. And now by using the window command, mm -hmm. we'll hit the luminosity button, bring up the view of that. There it is. And now watch, I can bring the left hand window in is going to take out all of the shadows and not apply to the shadows. Right. So I just kind of watch for where those shadows turn black. I grab the right hand one. And it's going to, watch how it's actually going to invert as I move it. So it's going to take anything <laughs> yeah. that's outside of it and it's going to push it down. It's going to create almost like a solarized looking mask. So it's pulling off right. that change on all except for that narrow mid-tone range. So there we go. Now I can dial in that little bit of change just to the mid-tones. My highlights and shadows remain unaffected. Cool. So it really gives you powerful adjustments with that window command as well. Nice. Yeah. 
So you want to, uh, is that, that's basically the demo for the masking? Yeah, that's fun. all the cool new masking stuff. Of course, all that masking stuff builds together. Mm -hmm. So you could use the gradient mask, the masking bug, the regular brush tool. You can then uh, clean it up using the blur and chisel on the refine mask tool. Then you have all those global options in terms of the feather and the density and the window and create luminosity mass. They all work hand in hand. You can actually even make a color range mass now as well. And it's all working on the raw file. It's all working on the raw file. It's all non-destructive, copy and paste from layer to layer. I do that all the time. Or I'll I do, do the work too. on one, copy, paste it, invert it, invert it. on the yep. other layer to affect the opposite area of it. So, so cool. Yeah. So, and so for those of you who love the sky replacement, I think we'll uh, we'll show you. We got that uh, piece for Brian Matisse's. Yeah, this is a really really good photo, uh, kit. photo kit. All right, so you've got just one day to get a hold of that. Yeah, uh, yep. I think tomorrow is the last day to get a hold of that. So, so take advantage of it now. Take advantage of it. If you're interested in replacing skies, it's a great toolkit. So we're going to jump now into Q&A. This whole live session has been recorded. If you've come in late, don't worry. You can see what we've talked about earlier, see the live editing sessions. But for right now, we're just taking questions. If you have those questions, you know, put them in on the Facebook live stream, right on the chat window, on the viewer, on the website. Uh, but for right now, we're gonna kick off. Uh, the first question I've got, are, are there any plans to incorporate a portrait module like you had in Photo 10? Uh, and, and King, you sh well, you already did so yeah. some portrait retouching. Well, so portrait actually is a really important area to us. And we spend a lot of time talking to portrait photographers. I used to own a portrait studio. My wife is still a portrait photographer. Uh, finding the right way to do portrait retouching is a bit of a challenge. And it depends on the type of work you do and kind of what your, I don't want to say your sophistication level is. Uh, but there's a lot of ways to do it. So we give you a few tools today. So we, I showed you how to use the local adjustments on this photo to do some skin smoothing, mm -hmm. but there's also some other options that you can use. So in the same local adjustment area, there are some built-in styles for common things like the magic eye fixer for enhancing eyes. It will whiten the eyes and enhance the detail. Same thing with the toothbrush, which will actually go through and will whiten teeth up as well. So that makes it really easy to target those areas with the right kind of adjustment. And then there's also in the overall settings in both develop and effects, there's the skin retouching pane, which mm -hmm. will based on a skin color selection, so I can come in, pick her skin color. I can then control the amount of blemish removal. So that'll get rid of medium sized stuff like large pores, small zits, wrinkles, things like that. There's the smoothing option that will smooth out the skin. Mm -hmm. One for reducing shine and one for evening up the color of the skin. And that can all be, uh, it works on a color range mask, but you can always override that using your normal masking tools as well. So in a lot of cases, those are the base tools to use for retouching. Now in the past, we had a dedicated portrait module that actually did face detection and eye and mouth detection. And it was a pretty slow process to go through. It automated a lot of it in terms of you didn't have to do any brushing for it, right. but it was a slow process. When you actually compare them side by side, doing it this way was actually faster for most users. Now that said, Portrait is a very important area to us, and we have had feedback from users that they want to be able to do more of that automated or guided approach to it, and I think it's something that we're going to be looking at next year. Okay. Well, there you go. I, I thought it was pretty amazing how 
quickly and effectively you were able to do that retouching just using those local adjustment tools. It's very, very cool. Yeah, and the retouching style has kind of kind of gone back to a more natural look yeah. today. You know, you go back five years ago, everybody had that crazy porcelain skin, and <laughs> right. that just isn't the most popular look for most markets anymore. Yeah, so. yeah, it really never has been for me. I've always tended to like to paint my effects in really softly, my skin retouching. So. Yeah. We got a question on presets. Will my presets from Photo Raw 2017 go into the 2018 beta? Yes, yes. So actually everything that you've done in 2017 will find their way into 2018 automatically. So not just your presets, but all of your non-destructive edits. So any edits you've applied to your photos, those will come across as well. All of your smart albums, your albums, any extras you've added like borders and textures, those will come across. Even your preferences for you know window background color and things like that come over. We want to make it as smooth a process as possible going from the current version to the next generation. And I thought that was pretty smoothly handled from 10 to raw, even though it was a completely That was a really code. big shift, yeah. It, it worked really well. I, I found that as long as you didn't have develop moves in your presets, you could even go backwards. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. So, you know, and that's one thing to keep in mind with presets. When you're creating your presets, you have the ability to check the boxes of whether you want the develop settings or the effect settings, the local adjustments, and, and you get to kind of pick and choose. And I, I'd recommend be pretty judicious with using those develop settings and those local adjustment settings when you're creating presets. And know whether the presets you're using have those included or not, because you can go through and do a lot of work and develop and yep. just have it all kind of wiped out with a, with a click of a preset. Yeah, <laughs> I tend to only use the presets for effects yeah. myself, yeah. Uh, but you can use them in develop. Typically, the mm -hmm. only time I'll use it for develop is when I'm working on a shoot in a given location, right. and I know that everything's going to be consistent. I might do that to make it easy oh, to save if I'm going to go back to that same yeah. spot again. Yeah. Uh, that can be a handy way to do it in develop, but I wouldn't use it for general purpose effects. No. That's what effects is for. Develop is more uh, dependent upon the certain photo or scene you're working right. with. Very, so. very photo dependent. Yeah. Dual monitor support? Dual monitor support is another interesting topic. It's pretty high on the Photo Raw project, so <laughs> I would not be surprised to see that in our future as well. Okay. So. All right. So we're not, not sure when, but it is. It's on. It's on the back of the mind. I, I can't right. commit to a to a date for that yet, but yeah, that is high on our on our to do list. All right, we've got a question about the Lightroom migration tool. When you choose to import photos with Lightroom settings, do you end up with a second set of photos after the export import process? Yes. Yes. So the way the Lightroom migration tool works is it will bring across all of the photos that you've cataloged in Lightroom, and it also bring across any of the collections that you uh, create any of the keywords or other metadata that you add to the photos. But when it comes to the actual photo settings, that's a very difficult thing to translate from one platform to another. To really get an exact match is impossible because the algorithms that we use and the options we have are a little different than what Lightroom uses. So you kind of have two options. You can either bring across all the stuff I talked about and not bring across your photo editing settings, or there's a checkbox which will let you do that, but it's going to make a copy of the photo with those Lightroom settings applied to it. And that can be a TIFF or a PSD or a JPEG, depending on what your preference is set to in that dialogue. There's someone here asking if there's a, a, a just a, a quick key to get a full screen view of their image you know, with, without closing down all the panels and making all the movements to sort of get it full screen in the loop view. So for me, I just hit the tab key. Uh -huh. The tab key hides all the chrome on the sides. Right. You'll still see the module selector and the tools on the side, but it's pretty darn close to, to full screen. If you do that, just hit the tab key. So, okay, tab key. So if you're in the loop view. Yes. Otherwise, you get a full screen view of the grid if you're in the grid view. <laughs> yep. The, yeah, that's, and that's my trick. And mm -hmm. shift tab will even close anything above or below. Like if you've got the film strip, does that work? Uh, tab will close the film strip automatically. Oh, I think. Ta tab close. Yeah. Okay, so you don't even have to do that. Cool. All right. iPad Pro. Will you be able to use uh, the mobile software on the iPad Pro, I think is the yeah, question. Yeah, you bet. Uh, on one photo for mobile will work on the iPhone, the iPad, iPad Pro, any modern iOS device that I think is uh, iOS 10 and above. When we have some more questions on the iPhone app, so mm -hmm. can, can you edit in the app? So it's not for editing for in terms of like adjusting your brightness or your contrast, but you can edit metadata. So you could change the star rating, you could make it a favorite or a reject, you can view the metadata, you could share to social media services like Instagram. Okay. It's a great way to, to do that. Well, when people are asking, you know, how, how are the photos stored? Are they, are they stored in the cloud? Are they stored in the phone? And your machine, I mean, how is it syncing between everything? So when you take pictures on your phone, the 
the mobile app is powered by Dropbox or Google Drive. It's whichever account you use. You don't have to sign up for an additional account for it. It uses those syncing service back ends to get the photo back to your desktop. So it will, you take the photo on your phone, it will then upload it to Google Drive or, or to uh, Dropbox, and then it will appear here inside of Browse in, do, 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 right here in your mobile uploads section in Browse, any of the albums. So you can go into the phone and you can say, I want to sync this album, this album, this album. I just do the all photos one so that every photo I take sure. comes back automatically and they'll appear in here. And then from here, I can manage it however I want. I can drag it to whatever folder, delete them, rename them. Uh, it's a great way to do it. Think of it like your like a regular camera. I'm mm -hmm. not deleting the photos off the memory car. The right. photos still live on my phone and are managed by however I like to manage the photos on my phone. It just gets a copy back to my computer and you can pick back which to editing machine. Yeah. yeah, that's great. I've got a, a question here that I'm super excited to answer. There's someone asking, I'm completely new to photo editing. How should I start learning to use on one? And and I'm just going to give you a big pitch for for on one plus because we have a comprehensive course library in there for you to learn everything from the basics to advanced tools in on one and also in other software too. We even have it for Lightroom and we have all kinds of courses like approaching the scene and landscape and travel that'll give you a basics guide to taking control of your camera and making your own creative decisions instead of using the auto mode all the time. And then, you know, there's some Matt Glaskowski's guides in there to mm -hmm. using the software. There's just a ton of resources and a community of people that are anxious to, to work together to become better photographers and better editors. And there's a really vibrant community forum and people are getting their questions answered. There's a ask a coach session where I and the other coaches will jump in and answer your questions when you ask them. It's a, it's a really, really great resource. Yeah, I think so. If you want to master photo raw and you mm -hmm. want to become a better photographer, that's the best place to do it, I think. And it keeps your software up to date all the time. I mean, there. Yeah, if you do Plus uh, Pro, mm -hmm. it includes the software as well. So that right. way, every year you're always up to date. So. Right. All right. So the next question, does the beta version work parallel to the existing photo raw, meaning no need to uninstall my previous yes. version? Yes. The new one will install side by side with it. So nothing bad happens to the previous version. You can always roll back and continue to use the previous version. We basically make copies of everything that we need for the new version. So. We have a whole bunch of people asking about my brand new camera, the Nikon D850, <laughs> and, and I'm I love this camera. It's my favorite camera I've ever had by quite a long shot, uh, and I was really really impressed using Photo Raw 2017 and also 2018 that when I brought my my true NEF out of the camera raw files into a folder and opened it in Photo Raw it saw them and let me start editing them. Now, it wasn't maybe quite as quick as it's eventually going to be, but they're there and I can edit them. And certain other software that lots of us know uh, is requiring you to convert it to a DNG to even see it. You know, I tried to import my files and I got this cannot read file uh, and you got to go through the DNG conversion. And I'm not a big fan of DNGs. Personally, I'd rather to keep my pristine out of the camera raw file untouched. So... Yeah. Good job on yeah. that. I mean, there's, so there's preliminary support for the D850 in there right now. It won't be quite as fast and the color won't be quite as vibrant or accurate as it will be in the final version. Okay. So that's one we're still working on. But yeah, we'll definitely have support for that. Plus there's uh, four or five other new cameras are added and a bunch of new lenses for lens correction as well. Very, very cool. Uh, we've got someone asking when this recording of this live event is going to be posted, and it will be posted this afternoon. Have no fear. Um, has the crop tool been enhanced to let users define and save crop ratios? Actually, can you? I can't remember. I thought it already did that. But I thought it already did yeah, that, Yeah, so certainly in, in, uh, inside of develop and resize, right. you can do that. And you can easily enter a custom crop ratio. Yeah. It's a lot easier now than it used to be. That was actually a change we made in uh, .5 or .6 yeah. last year, if I recall. All right. And it will remember your last setting. So if you know, you're always doing 6 by 10 aspect ratio, it will remember that for you. Here's a question that I can absolutely say now. Are the protection measures gone? That We didn't showcase some of the blending options, you know, the skin tones and mm -hmm. highlights and shadows. Um, no. No. <laughs> Those are still there. We, Those remain unchanged. Yeah. So. Very, very powerful part of, uh, of the effects blending options. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. Is resize a part of Photo tw Raw 2018? Mm-hmm. Resize and layers. We didn't really dig into those uh, modules today, but those are still part of 2018. Yes. 
Someone's asking about the panorama files that come out, whether it's also a proprietary raw file similar to HDR. We didn't on those. There wasn't a requirement right. because it wasn't that linear raw data. It's yeah. already post-processed data. So mm -hmm. those actually will be a TIFF or a PSD based on your preferences. So in the preferences, you can set what you want the default save format to be. Uh, has there been optimization for Fuji's RAW files at this point? We continually make improvements uh, for Fuji files. They are uh, an interesting file format and we're always making improvements for that. An area that we're intently working on right now is highlight recovery, continuing to refine and improve that. And I think we'll see some uh, improvements in that in this release as well. Very cool. All right. Here's someone asking a question that I ask Dan all the time and I, I know he's working on. Uh, are you going to have soft proofing? <laughs> There's a lot of us who love to print and yes. have the ability to preview yeah. exactly what the print's going to look like on the paper yeah. for a calibrated monitor will be. That is one that we're certainly going to be uh, looking at for the next year. A lot of people don't know there's actually a, a pretty powerful print module built in already. So, you know, you could take a photo like this one. I can go to print. I'm not sure what printer. Oops. I'm also working on a pre-release version today as well. So keep in mind there may be a few little bugs in there. I can control the paper size, how it fits on mm -hmm. the paper, which printer I'm going to use, what paper size I'm going to use, what printer profile I want to use. I can import my own custom printer profile. So if I wanted to make an 8x10 of this, I could pick the size. I can say I want it to be 10 by 8 and I'll get an 8x10 on that 85 by 11 piece of paper and I can say I want to print it on matte paper heavyweight using relative color metric and I can print straight through. It doesn't soft proof yet. That is something right. we'll be talking about in the future though. Good. <laughs> That's one of those little things that, that I need for my day to day and I know there are a few other people who do too. So. Yeah. Um, there's a question here about aperture migration. Aperture is long gone. However, there's people with tons of settings. Is, is there any way to get those settings from aperture transferred? Uh, Apple aperture was... Yeah. Uh, That's a good question. You know, I will work on a blog post to give people the best instructions for how to migrate from Aperture over. Now, in terms of the, the editing settings that you've done in Aperture, that'll kind of be the same as it was with Lightroom. You'll need to create a copy with those settings rendered to it. There's not a way to translate those non-destructive settings into our non-destructive settings and get anything that looked close to the same just because all those algorithms vary a lot. Okay. We have a bunch of people asking about the, the new file that comes with HDR, your new linear uh, raw-like file, mm -hmm. and, you know, comparing it to DNG, just kind of describing how it works, I guess, you know, are you, will sidecar files will contain the metadata? Yep, uh, it will... It's a good I can't actually remember if it writes a sidecar file, if the, that data gets written to the file itself. I can't recall off the top of my head. Think of it kind of like a DNG, but it's just kind of our version of a DNG instead. It uh, appears in our app, stores that linear data. It leaves it open for future uh, enhancements, improvements. So as we add other features that might need that sort of data structure, it lets us have that in a transportable way. The other option would be just to save into a database, but we prefer to keep things in a real file so they move from computer to computer and back up correctly. So. Someone's asking here whether there are going to be something like Lightroom's virtual copies in PhotoRAW. And, and Dan, earlier, when he was, you probably missed the earlier part when Dan was previewing all the new features, we've mm -hmm. got versions now and it, it functions yep. identically. Very, very close yeah, to that. Yeah. Very, very close. So, uh, Someone's asking if the mobile app's going to be included in the beta or if it's included with PhotoRAW 2018. The, the mobile app is free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not part of the beta program kind of due to the way the App Store works. We can't really uh, release that until the final version. There's not really a, a way for um, folks to beta test that right now. So that'll be available uh, at the end of the month. So we have some questions about how well PhotoRAW 2018 is going to play with others. Is it going to still be a available as a plug-in, say, to Lightroom, it, are you going to be able to edit in other platforms <laughs> outside of it? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah. We try to keep things as, as open as a, as a non-destructive editor can be. Uh, so you can use it as a plug-in to Photoshop or Lightroom. You can access, develop, and effects and resize from those other platforms. Uh, there's built-in batch processing to make it easier to batch. And then from Browse, you can send photos from Browse to any other app. So if you still use Photoshop to do your layered work, you can easily right-click on a photo inside of Browse and say, send it to Photoshop. Or you can use Browse to do your culling because it's such a fast browser. 
it's way faster than going through that import process with Lightroom. You come back, you point it towards you know a thousand or two thousand photos from a wedding, for example. You can very quickly go through get rid of the ones you don't want, tag your five stars or tag your pics, then send all of those to Lightroom and Lightroom will pick up that metadata that you've entered inside of Browse and then you can catalog them and continue in a Lightroom workflow as well. So we try to keep things very open. Same thing with cloud stores, you know, supports Google Drive and Dropbox and Microsoft OneDrive. And honestly, you can set up any cloud service you want that uses a desktop syncing app behind it. Very cool. Very cool. Someone's asking whether the panorama tool will work with vertical and multi-row panoramas. It will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the things you have to keep in mind when you're photographing panoramas and when you're editing them, you want all the settings the same. You don't want to have auto ISO turned on. You want to be in manual mode. You don't want your shutter speed aperture ISO to be changing one bit. You want to set a white balance and stick with it. And then any global adjustments that you're doing to the images, you want to sync across the images before you blend them and you're going to get a much better result. Yep. Um, I'm actually working on a, a, a couple of books on panoramas and they're in the editing stage, so look for that. We'll have a lot more information about panoramas coming really, really soon. Um, mm. I have like a 16 shot matrix of Lenoma Falls. It's, you know, it's four up and, and four wide. Four, four, uh, four. And it's, gosh, I can't remember how many it is. I'm going to say it's like almost like 30,000 pixels on a side. It's huge. So you can do all sorts of stuff. Great. Yeah. I'm excited to be to be testing it out more with bigger and bigger stuff. Mm -hmm. So how about tethering? Is that something you guys are... Tethering is one that we see come up from time to time in the RAW project. It hasn't been as high on the list. It's something that uh, we'll be looking at in the future, but I, I don't expect to see it soon. Okay. But if it's important to you, go to the RAW project, give it, a, give it an upvote. And the more people who upvote it will help kind of change the future. That's why we make those decisions based on what you guys think. Yeah, if you guys missed the beginning of this key, of this live event, we talked quite a bit about how the development process is really driven by user input. Yeah. Uh, Omwen listens to what you guys want in the software, mm -hmm. and the Photo Raw project is the place to go. Tell them what you want. Vote up other people's comments. You know, go in and search. Make sure that somebody else hasn't already asked for it. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. Yeah. There's a really nice big search bar right at the top you can find. I, uh, I will mention one kind of workaround for tether shooting, though. Um, the reason a lot of other apps have to have that as a, as a feature is they require that import. So it has to know when that new photo shows up. Because Browse is always watching and scanning. Right. I just use whatever the tethered shooting software is that comes to my can. I shoot with Canon. I just use their shooting software. I shoot. It's tethered. It goes back to my desktop. As long as I'm looking at that folder, Browse sees that new photo instantly. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, that works great. I've done that too. Uh, let's see. Will you now be able to jump from develop to effects by simply hitting a keystroke instead of having to hit select the button on the <laughs> sidebar? That is a great question. I really want to get that in there. It's not there yet, but it is high on my list. Okay. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people in the Plus community too asking that, you know, they're converts. The from G key. The G I key. hit the G key, the G key all day long and it still doesn't go to back. Go to grid. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I hear you. I, I find hear myself. You. We're working on it. How about focus stacking? There's a lot of people asking for Ooh, features here. That is a, that's an interesting one, too. I see a few requests, not a ton of requests. Again, if you, that's important to you, go to the RAW project and vote that feature up. Yeah, the RAW project is the place to go with these feature requests. Uh, let's see. We're starting to get low on questions here. Um, there's people asking about lens profiles, the X70 Fuji camera. Yeah, I know you're updating lens profiles and yeah, camera profiles like all the time. A, thousand of them. I can't tell you if that one's in there off the top of my head. I think all the X series, if I recall, actually use the same uh, the same lens profile because it's all the same lens on the on the like the X30. If, I think that's part of that series, if I recall. I'm a little rusty on them. Uh, so that should be in there and work. Keep in mind the lens correction uh, will only match automatically on raw photos and that go through our, our tier one, our top engine. So if it's a really old or obscure one, it may not detect the lens automatically. You may have to set the pop-up for it instead. Here's a really good question. Can I use my own existing sky photos for sky mm -hmm. replacements like you were doing? Yes, you bet. And I'll, actually, I'll show you the easy way to do that. Let me just grab a different photo. Here we'll grab this one and we'll go into effects. There's two ways to do it. So one is just to take your photo into layers and then via layers you can add a photo from any place or if you go in and you add the texturizer, you notice there's a little import button right here. Mm -hmm. You click that import button, it brings up the extras manager and you can import 
uh, your own photos for backgrounds or for your own textures or your own borders will all come in here and then you can use it over and over again. It keeps a, keeps a copy of it around. When you install the, uh, uh, the photo kits that mm -hmm. include those or the preset packs that include them, they appear in here as well. That's where they jump up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have, well, like me, there's a number of people asking about whether you're thinking about supporting Android in the future for the mobile app. <laughs> Let's um, see how popular the iOS one becomes and, and then okay. we'll see about Android. Uh, so there's a question about how Plus members, the Plus Pro members, can get a hold of the software right now. It should just be already in your products. So in, it'll be in your product list, but keep in mind the beta won't be available till Friday. So okay. you don't have anything to download till Friday. When it appears on Friday, then you can download and install it okay. and sign in just like you normally would. It's already part of your account, so you can use your normal credentials. If you're not a Plus Pro member and you get the beta, you just sign in with the trial instead. Use the trial option. I keep getting a lot of questions about camera profiles. What's your schedule for adding camera profiles as cameras are released? I camera guess. profiles is really high on the list. I yeah. uh, can't give you an official date for that yet, but it won't be too long. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're getting kind of down towards it. There's a... Uh, what upload options are available straight from the software, like the social apps? So we got Facebook, Twitter, Flickr, 500px. So on the Mac, we use the built-in Mac sharing platform. So anything that has an extension to work on the Mac will appear. So if you click down here on the little share icon in the bottom right-hand corner, it will mm -hmm. pop up whatever you have configured on your system. So you can go to Mail or Messages or Facebook or Twitter, and there's a bunch of other ones that, that Apple supports that I don't have turned on. So that'll appear in there. On Windows, uh, you need to export the photo and then use a web browser to upload for sharing. So sharing is an area that we're interested in, and we're going to continue to make improvements in the future on that. Okay. So the rest of the questions that I'm seeing are mostly sort of feature requests. And, and my recommendation is jump over to the Photo Raw project, search to see if someone else has already requested that feature, chime in, join the discussion, vote it up, enter a new one if you're, if you're the first one to come up with it. Uh, you know, promote that crowdsourced user-based yes. product development process. I think it's really been an innovative, great way to drive the product right where most of the users want to see it go. Yeah, uh, and comment on, on how you want it to work. It's yeah. really important. It's not just that the, the feature is listed or how many votes there are for it. It's important to know how you want it to work, too. Right. So. Right. So uh, if you want to talk a little bit more about how the general public can get a hold of the beta and any more details about it. Um, yeah. So the beta, again, will be available on Friday. You'll just come right to our website and you'll be able to download it right off the homepage. Uh, from there, we'll continue to give you updates as new versions are made available for it. And you'll just sign in as a trial user. Right. Yeah. And the trial is 30 days. Yep, 30-day trial. Um, the full version will ship by the end of the month, so you'll have the full version in your hands before the trial expires. Very cool. And for all you Plus Pro members, it's just going to be in your toolkit uh, yep. as, a, as, a, as a, the beta first and then the full version. So, cool. you know, for everyone, I want to talk just a minute before we, before we wrap up this live event about the Plus community. Uh, it's been a real joy of mine to coach that community for the last two years. Uh, and I'm excited to be moving forward with that. We have a lot of great stuff coming before the end of the year. Dan here is doing a, uh, a live, uh, or you're doing a master's course on black and yep. white photography. Um, and then we're going to have a birds and wildlife course dropping before the end of the year. We have fun guest coaches coming. We got Matt Glaskowski coming back again. Um, so it's, it's just such a great, vibrant community. I love the interaction in the forums and the, the, the constant content that we have coming is just really, really a great group of people. I mean, I, I have a ton of fun coaching in there and I know that all the users have a lot of fun with the content that we create. And again, just like the photo raw project, we're listening to what everyone in the plus community wants to learn about photography and catering and designing content right for what the community wants. Mm -hmm. Next year, we have some really exciting, innovative stuff that I can't wait to take the wraps off of. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be really cool. We're going to have some more interaction and some more fun stuff happening and a bunch of new guest coaches coming along. So, you know, if you haven't checked out Plus, please do. It's a really great resource for both photo education and just photo community. Yeah. Um, for those of you that have come in on this event late, once again, it's all being recorded. That recording is going to drop this afternoon sometime, mm -hmm. and you'll be able to watch it from start to finish, see anything you might have missed, share it with other people that you know might be interested that have missed it. 
Um, it's been a, been a great, great uh, thing being here with you guys. I enjoy every, or I'm so, so happy that you guys all chose to tune in and uh, spend this this morning with us. Yeah, we really appreciate everybody, appreciate everybody coming. Your questions, your feedback is very important to us. And, you know, we're not done. Just like last year, we're going to continue to provide additional free releases with new features, more cameras, more lenses throughout the year. And even if you're still a 2017 user, there'll be mm -hmm. another update to 2017 before the end of the year fixing bugs, adding new camera support, things like, like that coming. Yep, yep. Yeah. So even 2017 years will be able to do that. Uh, more questions and feedback, go to the online uh, website, go to the Photo Raw project to give us ideas. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Those are all valuable uh, spots to uh, see what we're up to and give us more feedback as well. Thank you guys for coming. We look forward to the beta on Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.